Hey guys, my name is JC and today we're going to be discussing some cards from Phyrexia All Will Be One. The cards we're going to discuss today are not only powerful and staples within their respective archetypes, but they're also cards that you're very likely to see out in the wild when playing Commander. Alright, let's get started. Now the first card I wanted to discuss today is Elishnorn Mother of Machines. This is a 5 mana legendary Phyrexian Praetor with Vigilance that has 4-7 stats and says if a permanent entering the battlefield causes a triggered ability of a permanent you control to trigger, that ability triggers an additional time. Also, permanents entering the battlefield don't cause abilities of permanents your opponents control to trigger. So this is essentially a Panharmonicon attached to a creature, and if you've ever played an ETB or Flicker type deck, then Panharmonicon is always usually thrown in there just because of the raw value that it can actually generate. Now Elishnorn being a creature is usually seen as a downside for some players just because of the fact that it is actually more exposed to a lot more forms of removal. But I actually think in some ways this might actually be a benefit depending on the game that you're playing. Now when I say this, what I mean is that being attached to a creature body means that you can actually use it to attack and defend yourself. And the fact that Elishnorn actually has Vigilance means that it does a really good job of both. You can actually send it into attack. Having 7 Toughness means that it's pretty much going to be able to block most things that you're going to encounter. Unless of course you come up against some you know, big creature decks, which can certainly happen. But the fact that you can swing in unabated for the most part really makes it great because there is going to be some games where you may be in top deck mode or it's just simply a very grindy game perhaps you have one to two control players at the table and getting in for combat damage may be the only way that you actually close it out so yes in some ways being more exposed to certain types of removal can be a downside but i think it does actually get balanced with the upsides as well now the other thing that i really like about it as well is the fact that it actually has that interaction staple to it that Torpor Orb effect of permanence ETB and don't cause abilities of permanence your opponent's control to trigger. I actually think that's quite good and that sort of also helps to justify the one extra mana you're paying. Now normally I'm not really a bigger fan of those Staxi type of effects in Casual Commander, not necessarily because it tends to make some players uncomfortable or they just don't really get a lot of fun out of it, but I actually don't think that that type of um, interaction is actually all that effective in most situations, just because in Casual Commander compared to, say, Competitive Commander or CEDH, where it's a lot more of a known archetype what you're going to be running into, in Casual Commander you're running into a bunch load more different archetypes where you may come up against where decks where they really aren't running a lot of ETB effects, so really this sort of effect may not actually matter in quite a few games that you actually play. So it's a nice little benefit to have, but I don't think it's necessarily overpowered and um, you know, I have certainly heard the debates about whether this card should be banned or not, and I certainly don't think that's the case, but that's definitely a conversation for another time. So overall, I really like this new Elish Norn. It's going to be a new staple in ETB or Flicker type decks, and if not that, it's certainly going to be on the considered board for sure. So really, really like Elish Norn. Always love the Praetors, and this one's no different at all. So the next card we're going to discuss Really, really love this one. Um, this is Ikomoon Gauntlet. Now, it's an artifact for three mana, and it says Planeswalkers you control have zero proliferate and negative 12. Take an extra turn after this one. Also, whenever you cast a non-creature spell, choose a counter on target permanent. Put an additional counter on that kind of that permanent. Now, if you're a Planeswalker player or you have a Super Friends deck like I do, if anyone that follows the channel knows, we, we have a fairly good deck in Aminatu the Fate Shifter. That's our Super Friends deck on the channel. This is an absolute slam dunk for those types of decks because if you have played these kind of decks, you'll know that while those kind of decks are very strong at being able to interact and even accrue value, like a lot of Planeswalkers typically have ways of interacting with creatures, say, neg ticking down and being able to exile creatures or destroy them, and usually the upticks may be able to give you some form of card advantage, it does tend to struggle a little bit in being able to close out the game because the usual plan, if you don't run into the few cards that can help get your Planeswalkers to their ultimates or emblems, the plan usually ends up being slowly uptick into those, hoping that you can take out your opponent's creatures and keep the board clear so that in the few turns you'll get one of those Planeswalkers to ultimate and then hope that the ultimate you actually get either causes your opponents to concede. I know that's not usually a good thing to necessarily say, but that is part of the Planeswalker plan to get the opponents to concede. But if not that, you just hope the emblem is enough that it shuts them down largely enough so that you can get the next emblems for your Planeswalkers and that. But now, this card actually provides us with a way of being able to get to those ultimates faster. So not only are we getting to them faster, we're potentially getting multiple emblems off. Now, 
I know the negative 12 takes an extra turn one is certainly nice, but I really feel that's more of a win more case situation. If you tend to have five to six planeswalkers out where you can already get them to this negative 12, I feel like you could win already just by getting the emblems and not having to worry about that. So that's certainly a nice benefit, but yes, this card is absolutely great. Being able to uptick your planeswalkers, getting them to their ultimates faster just means that the planeswalker decks are going to be able to get to their win conditions faster and not necessarily drag out the game, which can honestly not only sometimes turn off your um, other opponents from playing against it, or at least enjoying playing against it, but it also brings more players to wanting to play this deck when you actually know that you have viable win cons that don't add an extra half an hour or 45 minutes to the game. So this is a really, really great, really great find for Planeswalkers decks. Happy to have it. So I think if you're running blue and you have a Super Friends deck, you're definitely going to have to slot this one in. It's a really, really great find there. Our next one is Mondrak Glory Dominus. This is a four mana legendary Phyrexian horror that has four, four stats. And it says, if one or more tokens would be created under your control, twice that many of those tokens are created instead. You also have paying one colorless and two white Phyrexian mana, sack two other artifacts and or creatures, put an indestructible counter on Mondrak Glory Dominus. All right, so now we have another effect here where similar to Elishnorn being a Panharmonicon or trying to imitate that effect, we have Mondrak actually imitating Anointed Procession. Really powerful card that pretty much every token deck will play if there's no budget restrictions in place and that. Now, the really, the, the really great thing I love about Mondrak here is that it actually ends up being about the same mana cost. Well, it is the same mana cost as Anointed Procession, but really I see a lot of upsides here. So whereas when we were talking about the four Elishnorn having the potential downside of being a creature and being able to be removed, Mondrak here actually has a way to protect itself by sacrificing other artifacts or creatures, which depending on the type of deck that you're in, isn't necessarily a downside either. And being able to give itself indestructible means that now it's really only going to be exile effects that are going to be able to get rid of it. So I absolutely love this card. If you're playing a token strategy, I think that you definitely have to consider it. The only reason why you might not want to run it is simply because you don't want too much redundancy on the effect. Maybe you're just happy having something like Anointed Procession or Possibly if you're in the colors, you have Adric and Nev as a way to be able to create tokens already. But really, I think this is just going to be a slam dunk, including anything that makes tokens at all in that. And in some cases, I think it might actually sometimes push out cards like Anointed Procession. If you're only going to run one or two in that, I actually think I would probably prefer to run Mondrak if I had the choice between uh, Mondrak and Anointed Procession. Really, really good card. Again, coming attached to a body once you give it indestructible and not only has the token making effect that you want, you're also able to attack with it, which is what typically a lot of token decks want to do eventually. If they're not doing it straight away and they're not aggro, they do eventually want to attack. So Mondrak's going to help that. It's also going to contribute to any cards you play that actually give your creature tokens or just creatures in general a buff. So absolutely big slam dunk. And even though I don't want to try to talk about too many of um, the channel decks here in the video right now, I just want to talk in general. This is an absolute slam dunk for Radadrabic. It's going to be able to do some absolutely crazy things in that deck. So very much looking forward to playing that there. Um, so yeah, Mondrak, yeah, absolute staple in any kind of token deck that runs white. All right, our next card is All Will Be One, a five mana enchantment that says, whenever you put one or more counters on a permanent or player, All Will Be One deals that much damage to target opponent, creature and opponent controls, or planeswalker and opponent controls. Well, look, this one, there's not too much to really be said about this. If you're playing any sort of counter deck that can reliably put a good number of counters on the, the permanents that you're actually playing, this is absolutely great. It ends up being a way to interact with your opponents by being able to take out their key creatures. And typically in Commander, creatures are going to be the ones that are going to have, I guess, the, the largest and most powerful effects that you're going to encounter frequently. There's just going to be more creatures that have powerful effects than any other archetype in most commander games that you're going to come up against. So being able to take out creatures, absolutely great. If there's no creatures to take out, you also have the choice of taking out planeswalkers as well, if you happen to come up against that archetype. But importantly, you can also target players as well. So once it's done being, or, you know, serving an interactive role, now we can also actually use this card to take out our opponents as well. So it's absolutely great. I love those cards that can always sort of serve two different roles. And this one being interaction for creatures, planeswalkers, and then also act as a win condition potentially as well, especially when you're, you're popping off in those counter focused decks and that. Absolutely great. Now, the one thing I will say though, is that I don't think it will go in every single counters deck. I think it needs to be in the decks that can actually reliably put a lot of counters on things. So 
really in this type of scenario, I'd say if you're in a plus one, plus one counter build, that tends to be the, the counters build where you can put a lot of things on all at once. I think that's where it's going to be the, you know, do the most work in that. But yeah, besides that, um, absolutely great card and really looking forward to seeing it um, be put into good use. Our next card, this one, not, um, not as splashy in regards to, um, it's, it's really our only uncommon that we're going to be discussing on today's video. And that is Canker Bloom, a two mana creature that is a Phyrexian fungus. It has three, two stats. And for one colorless and sacrifice in it, you can choose one. Destroy target artifact, destroy target enchantment, or proliferate. So this little creature, while it might seem fairly simple, it actually does quite a lot. Now, being so cheap to get down and also activate means, you know, it can take out artifacts, enchantments. That's great. That's always something that we want to be able to take care of. The proliferate is going to have more niche circumstances where it's probably going to be really relevant in certain types of decks. Like I can certainly see it, you know, of course being um, important in counter type decks and that, but even decks like, you know, Meron that care about experience counters, they're going to love this. So like, you know, there are other effects that we have like this already. We already have some, you know, effects like this in green as well as white as well. But the thing I really love about this one is because it is a sacrifice effect, I think it's going to also play really well into aristocrat type strategies. So if you have an aristocrats deck that's been looking for a slot to be able to take out artifacts and enchantments, this one's going to be able to slip right in there in that. If you're playing a recursive type deck, this is also great because you're going to be able to continually sacrifice it, bring it back from the graveyard, and then be able to use it again. And that's so a fairly simple creature, but the fact it is a sacrifice effect means that I think it's going to have a homes in a lot of places and that, you know, pure creature decks, they might want to run it if they want redundancy and they have the other effects already in their deck, they're going to chuck this one in. But yeah, Aristocrats effects, absolutely going to love this. So just a real solid all around uncommon that I think, you know, you're going to see a lot of play in. All right, our next card, and this one's going to be for the equipment decks, is Sword of Forge and Frontier. This is an artifact equipment with... This is an artifact equipment which says, Equip creature gets plus two, plus two, and has protection from red and from green. And whenever equipped creature deals combat damage to a player, exile the top two cards of your library. You may play those cards this turn. You may play an additional land this turn, and it has an equip cost for two. So I will admit that equipment decks aren't normally my forte. It's not something that I've played a, a lot of in that. It's just not, not something that usually interests me, though, you know, hopefully that will change sometime soon. I am trying to look into this archetype more. But... Whenever I see any card that ever provides card advantage and mana acceleration in one, it's something that always gets my attention. And this is exactly what this card does. It's very simple, but in my mind, if you're playing an equipment deck, this is going to be something that you're going to be very happy to get down early. And if it happens to get into the late game where it's grindy or your opponents are really interacting with you a lot, this is going to really help you get above and beyond them by providing you a continuous source of card advantage. It's going to allow you to get in, which is always something that equipment decks want to do. You have that protection from red and green, which is really, really great. But now you're not only getting access to more cards, if some of those cards in the top two that are exiled end up being lands as well. Well, great. Now you're accelerating your mana as well. So, and correct me if I'm wrong, maybe some of the equipment experts out there may actually think that I'm wrong in this, but I don't think there's that higher density of effects, at least attached to equipment and, and a relatively effective, I will say effective equipment that can actually provide you with this ramping option as well as card advantage or really either or. So I think this is actually going to be a really good staple card that I think you should consider whenever you're playing any equipment deck, especially if you're trying to, you know, with your deck, trying to get it as on theme as possible. I know typically in these colors, if you're running green, you could certainly run effects. They're going to draw you cards better, but if you're trying to slam as many equipments into your deck to keep it on theme as possible, and you need to fill your card advantage and mana acceleration slots, this is going to be a real great one that you should certainly consider. And honestly, I don't see why you wouldn't want to run it at all. Really, really great equipment. Okay, the next one we're going to talk about is a land. And this one is the Mycosynth Gardens. It's a land sphere that can tap for a colorless. You can also pay one and tap it to add one mana of any color. Or you can pay X and tap it, and the Mycosynth Gardens becomes a copy of target non-token artifact you control with mana value X. So anytime I see any of these lands that provide a really powerful utility effect, I'm immediately in love, I'm immediately in love with it because it just provides you that, that option in your deck to do something spicy or something different, and you don't have to take a non-land slot out of it to be able to do it. And I love this because of the fact that we, a lot of decks do run artifacts. I won't say straight up that this is going to be a, a, a land you should consider to put in any type of deck at all. But if you're playing an artifact deck, 
where you're going to run, you know, quite a few utility artifacts that are going to provide powerful effects, you know, you know, artifacts like Panharmonicon, even though that necessarily won't be in an artifact deck, there are a lot of artifacts out there that actually provide a really powerful effect like that. And being able to copy that on a land, even if you do have to pay mana to copy it, many players are going to be happy to pay the same mana just to get a copy of another powerful artifact like that. They're absolutely going to love this land. I mean, you can even copy an artifact creature that may get buffs from having total artifacts. So all of a sudden now this land actually becomes a way to get some really strong combat damage through to your opponents. It's I mean, the possibilities are really endless with this land, and yeah, I, I absolutely love it. I think it's um, it's certainly going to be a consideration for one or two of the channel decks that actually run quite a few artifacts. It's probably not even really a consideration. I probably will slam it in there and that. So really great land, and I'm really looking forward to seeing the shenanigans that people are going to be able to come up with and play with this one. All right, and our lucky last card that we're going to discuss today is a card for the token decks, and that is Clever Concealment. It's a four mana instant that has Convoke and says any number of target non-land permanents you control phase out. So anyone that's ever played a token deck before or really any creature heavy deck knows that the number one thing that can really, really screw you over is when you get the board wiped. And while there are certain ways to be able to mitigate that, like making sure maybe you have a higher density of card draw so that you are drawing cards and when the board get, gets wiped, you're going to be able to replay those cards out again. Having a way to be able to not only protect your creatures from being able to get wiped, but the thing I love about this card in particular, saying non-land permanence, meaning that you can protect, you know, very powerful token enablers like Parallel Lives or the new Mondrak that's been spoiled, just means that this offers a lot more protection and being able to come on Convoke means you can really surprise your opponents out of nowhere. Now, you certainly want to be able to hopefully have some white creatures so you can actually pay for that white mana cost. But even if this means that you're only holding up one to two mana, maybe you, you can pay for the colorless cost with your token deck, but you can't really pay for the two white. Still being able to pay two white to phase out all of your creatures as well as your non-land permanents, I think is definitely worth the cost. And I think we should see this. It's certainly one you should be playing in your token deck just to add that extra density of protection effects and to just be able to give more resilience to the token strategy overall. So this is going to be an absolutely great card. It's going to probably go into any of the token decks that I'm going to be running in in the channel decks and that. It's certainly already been slipped into the ones that we have already. So absolutely great card. I think it's going to be a staple for a lot of token decks to come and really looking forward to playing it as well as maybe getting got by it as well. But that pretty much wraps up all of the new cards from Phyrexia All Will Be One. But what I'd love to hear now is is there any cards you think I may have missed that may actually end up being staples that are going to be seen broad play? And even if not that, I'd love to hear, are there going to be cards that for your specific niche, for your specific commander, that you can't wait to put into your deck and start to play out? And maybe even give me a little bit of a crash course of why that card's going to be really good. I'd really love to hear it. I always love spoiler season and I love hashing out new cards and, you know, maybe even discussing some of them might actually bring up some cards that I need to run in my decks that... I don't have already. So love to hear from you guys. Love to hear what you think about what we talked about today. Um, thank you for joining me and um, I'll see you guys around. Thanks.